Hello. Now what we're going to do is review zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. Now, of course, when I mention this material, you can dig down much, much deeper. As a matter of fact, a bunch of these diseases you could literally have just a lecture, a whole course on. I'm going to give you a taste of some of the things, obviously, I'm presuming you've read the text already. Now, in some cases, we're going to look at what the pathogen is for the disease. Where are their um, locations of the pathogen or any reservoirs, the symptoms and signs, the treatments that might be present, and if any, any vaccine exists, and also if it has any length of time and effect. Now, one of the things to help uh, some people is to understand what is a vector-borne disease. Um, what are zoonotic diseases? So what you see here is a couple of situations. Um, here's, of course, the human being. The vector-borne uh, disease will be something where a vector such as mosquito, flea, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a tsetse fly, a sand fly, and a whole host of other organisms that may transfer over the pathogen in inquiry. Now, sometimes zoonosis is a situation where uh, there's been a lot of development of certain organisms um, chicken farm, rabbit farm, pig farm, etc. And that's where the pathogen will cultivate and then eventually affect the human. Um, case in point, um, you have places in the world such as uh, in China that have what they call the wet, um, uh, basically the wet uh, grocers or the wet markets. And what happens there is you can get um, live, pick out live different types of uh, items. They may kill them for you there. Uh, chickens. Uh, there was a point where they were eating bats, snakes, heavens, all sorts of other things. And then you have the vector-borne zoonotic. In other words, this is a situation where normally um, you have the vector, but it's in interacting with something in uh, nature, such as birds or pigs or something else like that. But like a lot of organisms, they may either spill into a human area or developed by mutation, for example, a strain that is capable of infecting human beings. And so here's an example that you can see. It's the, life, uh, the Lyme disease and the tick life cycle. Now, the black-legged tick, Exoides scapularis in the, United, in the eastern U.S. and the Exoides pacificus in the western United States. Uh, the primary uh, Lyme, these are the primary Lyme disease vectors, and the ticks will feed on multiple hosts, and they need a new host for each life stage, larval, nymph, adult. Most of the time, you wouldn't necessarily have a problem, but <laughs> the ticks will feed not only on deer, and other forms of wildlife, but they will feed on humans. When they feed is when they're transferring over many different pathogens, and there's sort of a seasonality where there's a higher risk. An example would be uh, during a particular season, um, the eggs may be laid on, for example, the uh, white-footed mouse. 
the mouse winter is over. Uh, the larva on a single mouse could be anywhere from 250 to five, excuse me, 250 to 300 of these nymph or, or larval um, ticks. And they feed on them. And then eventually they get mature enough, they fall off, and they eventually will then uh, become capable of basically reaching out and feeding off of other organisms, deer and human beings, etc. So eggs, larva you can see here, so here's the mouse. And a lot of times they winter over on the mouse. Okay? And then from there, you have the greatest risk of infection uh, late spring, summer humans because the nymphs will climb up on grass stalks etc and they will grab on anything that moves by and it's then that they will begin to feed now by the way one little caveat um, a lot of times when a vector like a, a tick etc um bites there may not be a clear passage of infectivity for up to so many hours. Sometimes it's 36 to 48. Okay. Now this is the association between vectoral capacity and the basic reproduction reproductive number. And what you see here is here's the vectoral capacity, here's the basic reproductive number. Remember the R naught we talked about a while back. Uh, the plasmodium prevalence in NY Darlingi mosquitoes. And so what happens is the numbers down here refer uh, to the concentration or prevalence. And this continues and picks up over a period of time to the point where it's almost at the R naught. Okay. So we continue and we wanted to, I, I wanted to bring this out because a lot of people don't understand in some cases uh, the incubation that has to occur. So let's take a look here. What happens when a mosquito bites you? It basically doesn't always mean a transference of the disease. The mosquito must have picked up previously an infectious blood meal. Now, this is where we get into the life cycle of the pathogen. If the pathogen is being taken up, it will then reproduce in the midgut and then it will then move forward, migrate out of the mid gut, and they will migrate over to the salivary gland. So at the next biting, you have the salivary gland, which is also going to have a variety of other substances, anticoagulants, and it's going to have uh, substances that reduce the sensation of pain, etc., as it's feeding that's when you're going to get the transfer of the pathogens. Now, this is for the mosquito. There are other ones. Okay. This is an ex examination of the incubation of a virus or malaria parasite within the mosquito. And I think it's very interesting. One of the things you have to keep in mind is not all mosquitoes will carry certain pathogens. Not all mosquitoes will carry a particular type of a pathogen, either virus or a, a malaria parasite. But as you can see here, you had the mosquito feeding on a person in the acute phase of the disease. And what happens is, now this is for arboviruses. So what happens is that the feeding will bring the blood into the back where you will have uh, the replication of the virus in the midgut. 
and the viral shedding uh, by the mosquito in basically uh, the salivary glands, etc. Now, you want to keep in mind one other thing. Females are the only ones that are going to bite humans. Why do they bite? Because they need a high protein meal to help them to produce the eggs necessary. But the interesting thing here is also a concept of vertical transmission, meaning that the female is going to transmit the virus through the eggs. And so the eggs are going to be the next generation's uh, pathogen carriers. If we were going to look at this from the perspective of a malaria parasite, the malaria parasite is put into a person. The person uh, is sort of involved with the sort of asexual reproduction of the parasite. Okay, merozoites, sporozoites, etc. And then the next mosquito comes in, feeds off of it. And that means that feeds off the human, brings in these particular red blood cells that are now amply infected. The blood will be brought to the back area here where you have the breakdown of the blood cells. And the sporozoites kind of convert over into what are called gametozoites. Um, and there's going to be basically the oocyst and you're going to have basically the capability of the sexual reproduction, okay? In humans, malaria undergoes reproduction, making more of these type of merozoites and sporozoites, but there's no sexual reproduction. It's asexual, so it's making a copy. It is in the mosquito that you have the actual uh, sexual reproduction. So here you have the gametocytes, male, fem uh, male and female. They form together. Uh, they're going to form a zygote. And then what happens is they go through a series of cell specialization, cell division. And eventually what's going to happen is you're going to have sporozoites that will form. They will basically uh, get transmitted they will be attracted to the salivary glands. In the salivary glands, they will wait the next blood meal. Um, just like the rest of the saliva, they will get pumped in. Now, this is a schematic of a cross-sectional study. The persons that are recruited into the study are based on inclusion or exclusion criteria. Okay, so we're talking about the next disease and risk factor status. They're being assessed, uh, usually simultaneously. Now, this cross-sectional study is to collect uh, relatively, it, it's basically a relatively nice, quick means of collecting data. And you're able to make an understandable case for who has the disease, such as you see here who does not have the disease, and who has certain risk factors. So this gives us an understanding of the estimate of the prevalence of exposures and outcomes in the population sample. Now, this is a method of controlling uh, the vector. Okay, it's called integrative pest management. And you start from the point of prevention. You have an increasing toxicity as you get to intervention. Now, this might get a little confused, but I'll give you a little historical perspective. There used to be a time that they had, um, the governments, the societies had said, hey, DDT is a great thing. We can use it to control lots and lots of mosquitoes. And so they saw the the uh, decline in various mosquito transmitted diseases. And so what happens is you start coming first with cultural, uh, changing irrigation practices, uh, having resistant stock, crop rotation, things like that for controlling this. It sounds almost like you're trying to control 
um, plant diseases. To a degree, this can be applied for plant disease, but we're going to be focusing on human diseases now. We want to either prevent or intervene so that we can control the spread of these pathogens. And so we start off with mechanical, we continue with mechanical barriers, removal, uh, removal trapping. Um, this is basically going around and looking for wherever there are um, still water, where the mosquitoes would reproduce. Then we get up to the next level, which is biological. Now, BTI is a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. It had tremendous opportunities to help control certain types of insects. But there were other means to do it. Essential oils, if you spread them out on, on the top of the surface of the water, the developing larvae of the mosquito, uh, which normally just puts out sort of a, a little rear end probesis to breathe air, it gets choked off. Okay. And you could also cultivate natural predators. Well, we finally get up to the next point, chemical. And that's where you really use the big guns. Pesticide application. But it's, this is all integrative. And in, in basically, you're going through step by step how to control the spread of these pests. It could be ticks, mosquitoes. Yes, it could be also plant pathogens, but it could also be other types of pathogens. Um, some of them have actually been introduced into um, what you would say is the um, state. Let's take Florida, for example. The tropical bont tick. You could have a variety of other um, pathogens that have come up. And it's interesting that we're starting to find how some of these newly invasive species carry other types of disease. So we're going to move on here. And you can see here, this is uh, urban green infrastructure and potential mosquito habitat. Here's the biggie. A lot of people think, okay, mosquitoes are going to be out there in the swamps and in the, you know, forest and all this other stuff. Guess what? Not true. You could have stormwater. You could have runoffs. You could have old planters that have collected water. And they will become uh, breeding grounds for the mosquito. And... You can see how a lot of this occurs. Maybe some of you, this you see even in your local area where you live. So when you get a uh, type of mosquito that could carry a disease, the means to which you want to control them, yes, even in an urban environment, is to look around, see if there are rain barrels, and see if... Um, there are means in which you have to disturb, destroy uh, those collection sites because they are breeding grounds for the mosquito. So let's go over some of the points and then we're going to go into individual situations here. Zoonotic diseases are infections that are spread between people and animals. Uh, these infections are caused by germs, you know, it's bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi. Some can be very severe, some can be life-threatening, such as rabies. Others may be milder, get better on their own. Uh, zoonotic diseases are very common. Then we get to deal with vector-borne diseases. Now, these we're dealing with are human illnesses, they're caused by parasites, viruses, bacteria that are transmitted by these vectors. Now, many of the vector-borne diseases can also be zoonotic diseases. That's why it can get a little bit confusing if you're going through this. 
What you need to keep in mind is diseases that can be transmitted, transmitted directly or indirectly between animals and humans. When I talk about a vector, this is a living organism that transmits an infectious agent from an infected animal to a human or to another animal. And we could be talking about all sorts of things, arthropods such as mosquitoes, ticks, uh, flies, fleas, lice. Recently was a study that came out about chiggers and they may carry um, typhus. Then we have also the possibility of certain diseases being transmitted. And it used to be just that they were just a pest and that is bed bugs, but now they're having some suspicion. They may transmit certain types of diseases wherever they feed. And then, of course, we've got the reduvid bugs, which can transmit uh, Chagas disease. But one of the things I want you to keep in mind is also this. When we know that vectors will transmit the infectious disease, there are a means in which they may do it actively or passively. And this is where we get into what we define as biological or mechanical vectors. Let me clarify this. A biological vector such as a biological vector such as mosquitoes, ticks, what's going on there is that they carry the pathogens and the pathogens will multiply in their bodies and be delivered to new hosts. Usually it's by biting. Mechanical vectors, it's a little bit different. For example, flies can pick up infectious agents on the outsides of their body and transmit them through physical contact. Uh, you have flies that will pick up bacteria, etc. They've been bouncing around on animal manure, and then suddenly the fly lands on food, an outdoor picnic. What's more often that will occur also is the flies will be going through the same animal manure, uh, dog feces, etc., and pick up eggs of parasites like tapeworm, etc., then land on food. And the person then gets the tapeworm disease. Uh, finally, I, I wanted to include one, cockroaches. Cockroaches are yucky, and many people will say that, but one of the things that cockroach a lot of times will have is salmonella bacteria on its ex exterior. And so when cockroaches show up, they show up in different parts of the uh, different parts of the household. They may come in contact with either food or where food is being processed and deliver the salmonella bacteria that way. Okay, so let's start dealing with a real uh, specifics. In this case, we're going to go through a, a number of diseases. Malaria. This is a very life-threatening disease. It's caused by parasites that are transmitted to people through the bites of infected female Anopheles mosquitoes. The irony is that it's preventable and curable. Now, for humans, it's caused by four species of protozoan parasites of the genus Plasmodium. So that's Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium malariae, and Plasmodium ovale. Heads up. There are some species of Plasmodium that do not bother humans, but they will bother other types of either mammalian or bird. Uh, one case, it was the introduction of a particular type of malaria, which they call avian malaria, that led to basically, if you go to the island of Hawaii, uh, there are no birds at lower altitudes of these particular species because um, the mosquitoes that carried this avian malaria um, would kill off the birds, but the mosquitoes will not uh, exist above a certain elevation on the mountain sides, et cetera. So that's where if you go above that uh, thing, and I'm, I'm trying to think if it was 1400 feet or something like that, 
they will be present. The birds will be present. Now, one thing also you've got to keep in mind, people traveling to areas where malaria is commonly typical, a lot of times will take protective drugs before, during, and after the trip. These include things like avantoquinol and proguanine, which is also known as, uh, together as malarone, chloroquine, primaquine, doxycycline, mefloquine, uh, tafinoquine. Now, there are also a series of newer drugs for the treatment um, <clears throat> that are basically chloroquine in combination with pimethamine and sulfadoxine, um, mefinoquine, primaquine, and artemisin. Now, artemisin is the, the researcher who discovered it and isolated it, got the Nobel Prize for it. She'd always heard that there were Chinese herbs that helped treat um, malaria. So she was able to isolate from this artemisin and plant the active agent. Now the plant is, of course, Artemis uh, annua. It's a type of wormwood. And it was fantastic. A sad caveat to all of this. If you go to different parts of the world, the malaria there is now demonstrated to be resistant to artemisicin, uh, primaquine, chloroquine. And that's why they're starting to make combinations of drugs. Okay. Here you can see basically the life cycle of the malaria. Here, this is an interesting thing. Uh, on this side here, on the right side, you have the Department of Health Mosquito Control Flyer for Florida. And it talks about symptoms of malaria, how to protect yourself from it, how to stop the mosquitoes from breeding, and how to basically keep them on the outside instead of going on the inside. All right. Um, the next disease we're going to talk about is yellow fever. Now, yellow fever is different. It's a viral disease. It is an acute viral hemorrhagic disease from the viral family uh, Flavoviridae, transmitted by mosquitoes. Now, the mosquito is Aedes aegypti mosquito. Now, the interesting thing is that this is a mosquito that bites mostly during the day. Some other mosquitoes you've heard of, they feed mostly at night, etc. So if you protect yourself, everything's fine. This one isn't. Symptoms. Mild cases will include fever, uh, headache, nausea, vomiting. Uh, more severe symptoms include very high fever, jaundice. That's where you get the yellow fever concept because what happens is your skin and the whites of the eyes will begin to turn yellow. There will be hemorrhaging, that is bleeding, shock, liver failure, kidney failure, and then death. Approximately 30 to 60% of the people who have the severe form of yellow fever will die. There is no specific antiviral drug for yellow fever. The patient should rest, stay hydrated, and seek medical advice. There is a vaccine, YFVAX. It's a live, weakened form of the virus, and it's given as a single shot. Oh, yes, and I forgot to mention about malaria. The uh, WHO and a lot of other organizations have been funding trying to find a malaria vaccine. They're getting closer, but seven, one case they've developed one that makes that's about 75% effective. But that's not the best reassurance if you go into a malaria infected area. By the way, yellow fever has notorious for causing massive amounts of death 
Um, there are some uh, books, articles about this, even within the United States, that there were yellow fever outbreaks. Now you can see what happens here. With yellow fever, you're going to have 55% are asymptomatic. And so therefore, you're not going to easily detect them. There's nobody that's going to be able to understand them or detect them or anything else. Then you have a febrile illness, which is 33%. And the only really amount that is detected by surveillance is fever, jaundice, and maybe or maybe not hemorrhage. That's 12%. So what we're talking about here is you have to have a small number show up before surveillance and the strategies are unleashed because they don't even know that the yellow fever exists. Now, the yellow fever vaccine recommendations in Africa and the Americas, you can see where it is in yellow. And to a lesser degree, um, in the gray, it's not recommended. The areas that are white, it's not recommended. But the area in sort of this burnt orange down here have been updated on its recommendation due to outbreaks. Usually when we talk about yellow fever, there are several different approaches. One of them is uh, what they call jugnal or sylvanic, where normally the, uh, the infected mosquitoes have been going and infecting um, mammals that are in the jungles or mammals that will sustain the infections for the mosquitoes. And usually in those mosquitoes, you're talking about these different types here, Aedes africanus, and then several of the other types. With intermediate or savanna situations, here you may have Africa only, and you have this transference, and this is by a semi-domesticated Aedes species uh, for the transfer of yellow fever. Now, what about urban? Urban, and you have to remember that in certain parts of the world, the dynamic is for further urban immigration, for work, and a lot of other things. But unfortunately, that makes the population density much greater if an outbreak occurs. And so what happens is with urban is you have one person that's infected. Uh, the mosquito comes in, takes some of the blood, spreads it out. This is usually Eddie's Egypti and spreads it to another person who is not infected, but now will be by a bite of the mosquito. The interesting thing is you have a period of infection and a period of intoxication. The period of infection, let's say the mosquito bites and transmits the, uh, the virus here at zero days. From between zero and about a, anywhere from three to six days, you've got incubation. Then you start having viremia. Now, keep in mind something. This is the period where if another mosquito came and bit the individual and took up the blood, they will be able to transmit this up to others. Okay? Usually within about a period up to about maybe 15 days or so, you have a period of remission. It's a short period, 24 to 48 hours. Okay. Then you have this 12% that go on to a period of intoxication. Now, if you notice by comparison, the symptoms and signs here compared to the, the intoxication. These are much more uh, devastating in the sense of fevers, vomiting, headache, epigastric pain. Now, epigastric prostration, malaise, we're all starting to point toward a liver. The jaundice is clearly an indication of liver damage. Then you start dealing with convulsions, hypotension, low blood pressure, and urea, stupor, coma, and shock. So 
So these are the timelines. And this nice little chart gives you a perspective of the various structures of the body affected by yellow fever virus. Okay, and you can see a systemic effect, but then specific organs that will be um, damaged by the virus, etc. Now we're going to move into rabies. Oh, rabies. Rabies is a fatal but preventable viral disease. It's caused by the Lyssa virus. It can spread to people and pets if they are bitten or scratched by rabid animals. Now, if you say scratched, what do you mean? Well, a lot of animals will uh, lick their paws. Okay. In licking their paws and then scratching someone, it's the same thing as being bitten because that saliva which contains the virus is going to be uh, transferred through the clawing of an individual. Okay. Um, most of the time, though, we focus in on the salivary glands. Uh, we see this in wild animals like bats, raccoons, skunks, and foxes. As a matter of fact, what happens is in some states, they have done this in the past, when they finally had devised the uh, rabies vaccine, um, years later, they were having outbreaks. For example, in the state that I used to live in was Massachusetts. And you just can't corral all the infected raccoons. What you can do is take feed pellets that the raccoons would be attracted to, incorporate into them the vaccine, and then by helicopter fly over areas that you know have a lot of the raccoons and basically uh, distribute the pellets that way. Now, um, the first symptoms of rabies may be similar to the flu, including weakness or discomfort, fever or headache. There may be a discomfort, prickling, or even an itching sensation at the site of the bite. Now, children often develop difficulty in swallowing. This is referred to as foaming at the mouth because they have the inability to swallow the saliva. But they also will demonstrate hydrophobia. This is the sight of a glass of water may actually terrify the person. I've seen videos of this, not just with children, but with adults. They try to bring the person a glass of water and they start shaking and they really can't get the glass of water down. Okay. The symptoms also may last for days. The symptoms then progress to cerebral dysfunction, anxiety, confusion, agitation. What you have to understand is that the virus is going to do a retrograde transport from the site of the bite up through the nervous system, up to the uh, central nervous system. Okay. There are effective vaccines and they provide immunity to rabies when given soon after exposure. There is no cure for rabies once it's moved into the brain because it's protected by the blood-brain barrier. The treatment for suspected exposure to rabies includes one dose of gamma globulin and a series of shots of rabies vaccine over the next two weeks. Sadly, once the symptoms appear, it's nearly, nearly always fatal. So the vaccine can prevent infection, by the way, and this may sound a little bit upsetting. If someone's been exposed and they get the vaccine for humans, that is, these are injections that occur into the stomach. They used to be 30 days of a single injection each day for the next 30 days into the stomach. Now there's been a reformulation that has, I believe, four shots again in the stomach, though, to help the individual. Okay. Now, I'm just going to go over this cursor. You can read as you wish. 
The structure of the rabies virus, they refer to it as sort of like a bullet shape. And you have the matrix proteins, the phosphoproteins. You have the large RNA polymerase protein. And then you have a nucleoprotein and the lipid bilayer. Excuse me. And what happens is that once the virus gets in, it's going to, of course, replicate itself. Um, you will have this eventually get into other cells, but primarily mostly the nervous system. Okay. And this is more of a information about how you have retrograde transport. Once you have entry, you have the axonal transport system of the uh, virions going into the soma of the neuron, and this will continue, and you'll have the, the replication of even more of the viruses. They will eventually get up into the central nervous system. Now, Rabies distribution immunization recommendations. Well, what happens is, if you notice, that all of these areas, particularly rural, seem to have a higher probability of having rabies in the area. The United States, what happens is that exposure can occur through carnivores, other mammals, you know, like foxes, etc., wolves, raccoons, um, will happen if you have uh, pet dogs that are not vaccinated. That's why it is so crucial in this country that vaccination occurs. As a matter of fact, even if you want to take your dog to be groomed, First thing the groomer is going to say is, I need a copy of the rabies vaccination paperwork. Okay. And you can see that this includes the recommendations of who should be getting immunization for the rabies. All right. Now, we have come to see that there are uh, virus variants that are associated with human rabies cases. Fortunately, in our strategies of dealing with um, pet laws to control uh, dogs so they don't become uh, rabies carriers, and also the rapid getting individuals to a medical facility you can see where the carriers here have been bouncing up and down. Most of this here is due to foreign dogs. Okay. And the other major contribut contributor to rabies has been bats. Okay. Um, and these are going to be the factors that contribute to the uh, risk of human rabies deaths and exposures in the United States. Now, this is sort of a nice algorithm for rabies post-exposure management of travelers. What to do if an animal bites during uh, international travel? Obviously, you want to wash the wound thoroughly with soap and water. But you do have to seek medical care as quickly as possible. And then you have to get as much information as possible. You, if necessary, have to fly to the nearest country with advanced medical facilities. Was the rabies pre-exposure vaccination received? No. Then these are the strategies for the person who has been bitten. If it's yes, um, human RIG, all right, this is the immunoglobulin, 
but you're still going to put the person on the rabies vaccine for a while. And you can see sometimes these are very, very scary. Um, I have met with uh, postal people and being when I was a young kid, I was a, a newspaper boy delivering newspapers. It is a scary thing to get bitten by a dog. It's scarier because when the bite occurs, there will always be the inquiry. Let's see the paperwork for uh, the most recent rabies vaccination by the dog. And if they're, and, and a lot of times what they'll do is to ensure that there isn't any other situation, what they'll do is they'll isolate the dog. Now, if the dog doesn't, a dog starts showing up with some evidence of rabies, they have to basically take, decapitate the dog, send the dog into a, a public health center and basically dissect the brain and look for strain, uh, the presence of the viruses, of the rabies virus in the brain tissue. What you see here is the pathophysiology of rabies for a human being. You get a bite. Notice they said uh, virus-laden saliva contaminates the tissue, so the rabies virus goes in goes into the skeletal muscle and then moves into, uh, from the neuromuscular junction, peripheral uh, nerve endings. We eventually start going retrograde axonal transport to the spinal cord. Then we go up the transport to the spinal neurons and the axonal transport basically delivers this into the brain. And what you see there is you have the individual starting to show symptoms of this, okay? Um, one of the other things is they have a nice CT scan there showing the bilateral hypodensities, and that's because of the virus. Okay, next one. West Nile virus. Now, the West Nile virus, WNV, this is a enveloped, single-stranded RNA arbovirus that can cause disease in humans. Yes, it can infect birds. In some cases, when it first was really recognized in the late 90s going into the 2000s, a lot of individuals were told, you see a dead bird on the street, do not approach it. Uh, notify public health. Okay. A lot of times today we deal with uh, West Nile because humans will get it from an infected mosquito. Usually, though, if a person uh, is normal, healthy, etc., it's going to cause a mild flu-like symptoms. But it can cause life-threatening illnesses, such as encephalitis, meningitis, mengioencephalitis. West Nile virus is the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease in the continental United States. It's also interesting to note that symptoms may occur 1 to 14 days after becoming infected. If you have a mild disease, it's generally called West Nile fever. And this may cause some or all of the following symptoms, abdominal pain, fevers, headaches, sore throat, lack of appetite, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, rash, swollen lymph nodes. Now, the symptoms may last anywhere from three to six days, but they may also go and last beyond that to a full month. There's not a lot of antivirals to treat West Nile virus. It's usually primarily supportive care. Some researchers have tried several agents, uh, such as interferon, ribavirin, intravenous, immunoglobulin, but there's not clear efficacy data because basically all, all that's been reported so far is one controlled study that's been performed to date. Okay. 
here you have a situation. So you have the mosquito and it will bite the bird. And once it starts cultivating, the virus cultivates in the bird, the mosquito will feed off the bird again, carry it and infect other birds. The interesting thing is that when West Nile became uh, prevalent and known, everybody would watch migratory birds as well as the native birds in the area because the migratories could get infected, travel quite a distance and spread uh, the West Nile virus to other areas. Now, also you'll notice that we have the epidemiological characteristics of West Nile virus. Um, we look at several of the situations by year, by month of illness onset. Notice it's pretty much during the summer months and the average annual incidence of age group. There is something to be said about as adults get older, their immune system is not as functional, and so they may not be able to fight off uh, the viral infection as effectively. In some cases, they will actually die from it. As rare as it sounds, it does occur from time to time. Now, also, there are several situations. Um, the primary mode of transmission for West Nile virus is a mosquito bite. But you need to be aware of that there are other secondary modes of transmission, whether it's transfusion of blood, transplantation, whether it's transmitted in utero, breastfeeding, or in some rare cases in the laboratory. Um, the key point to keep in mind is that this is not a virus that should be taken uh, casually. And if you look at the breakdown here, 80% are going to be asymptomatic. You have another 20%, about 20% that are non-neuroinvasive. And there's a small percentage, about 1% that are going to be uh, neural invasive. And then when we talk about neural invasive, we're going to be talking about symptoms caused by the West Nile virus disease, such as meningitis, encephalitis, and acute flaccid paralysis. And you can see here, uh, this was based from 2009 to 2018 of the cumulative incidence per 100,000 population of West Nile virus neuroinvasive disease. And all of this on the eastern side of the Mississippi, not a lot, 1 to 24, 25 to 49, but then you get into the uh, prairies, etc. You have a greater amount. In some cases, up to 100%. You notice where the black uh, marks are here. And then it kind of tapers off and you get into the Rockies, but then you start getting into the flatland again, where the mosquito is going to be active. And up near Oregon and Idaho. Okay. Now that we've gone, gone through that, let's talk about tick-borne encephalitis. That's a mouthful, so we'll call it TBE. This is a virus that spread through the bite of an infected tick. Occasionally, TBE virus can be spread to people through eating or drinking raw milk or cheese from infected goats, sheep, or cows. Uh, TBE is caused by a tick-borne encephalitis virus. It's a member of the genus Flavivirus, okay, in the family Flaviviridae. It was really first isolated in 1937. There are three virus subtypes that exist. The European or Western tick-borne encephalitis virus transmitted by Exoides racinus. 
the European tick born encephalitis virus transmitted by Exoides persculatus, and then the Far Eastern tick born encephalitis virus. This is formerly known as the Russian spring summer encephalitis virus, and again it's transmitted again by Exoides perscalatus. Um, detection of specific IgM and IgG antibodies in patients' sera combined with typical clinical signs is really the principal method of diagnosis. There are later symptoms that can include fever, headache, vomiting, weakness. A few days later, you'll have severe symptoms that can develop, including confusion, loss of coordination, difficulty speaking, weakness of the arms, legs, and seizures. So this is all, by that time, got into the CNS, central nervous system. Sadly, there's no uh, special antiviral therapy for TBE. Uh, the treatment is basically relying on supportive management. If meningitis encephalitis or meningoencephalitis occur, this is going to require hospitalization and supportive care based on the syndrome severity. TBE encephalitis vaccines are very effective and available in many disease endemic areas and in travel clinics. They go by the names of Encelpur N and FSME Immunin CC. Okay, so where are these occurring? If you look, you've got this geographic distribution. You can see it's going down into the um, eastern part of China, South Korea. And then, of course, you've got a large swath through most of Russia. A couple of things to keep in mind. When you go from about oh, west, excuse me, east of the Urals, out till about here, the data isn't always as clear at times. Not anything to do with it being Russia, but the fact is that there's a lower population density. And so there are presence of ticks throughout these areas, just like up in here, it's possible. But the problem is there's not enough surveillance and other resources available to monitor this. Now, when it comes to um, the European part, uh, Finland, Norway, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Austria, Poland, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, Romania, and Greece. There it is. Now, I want to keep in mind something here. The transmission of the tick-borne encephalitis virus. These viruses are uh, really incredible in the sense that you have the larva, which may then act on either deer or mice, and eventually passed over to um, sheep, cows, things like that. If you notice the size comparison, nymph, adult male, adult female, engorged adult female, engorged meaning it's filled with blood. So really the transmission to humans is by direct biting or by the raw milk from the goat, sheep, um, but the cows, go, uh, sheep, goats that may have the infection. And if you notice here, this is where they're doing a tick removal. Okay. Ticks are quite incredible in the sense that they will bore down in and they will have this surging of um, sort of a saliva mix that will have uh, keep everything from clotting, in other words, the capillary bed. They will also use um, some of the components in the saliva will include an anti, not only anticoagulant, but also a painkiller. And this surging will go 
basically saliva out, blood in, saliva out, blood in. And so this goes on until this, bec this uh, tick becomes engorged. So that leaves you with some time. You don't always have an immediate infection by the bite. If you can quickly remove the tick, fine. But you don't pick it off. You notice how what they have to do here is hold on to it and sustain a pull, but not strong. The biggest disaster you can have is pluck it off and the head still remaining there because it's going to continue to keep pumping um, the saliva, which will include the virus, into the tissue. Now you have the spread of tick-borne encephalitis virus in the body, the site of entry. It's either going to use the blood, so it's going to be systemic. And you have the first stage of the illness in the regional lymph nodes, spleen, liver, bone marrow. Okay. You will also have this pathogen pass through the lymph flow. And all of this is going to go to the blood. Or, or I should say, and or the site of entry will eventually um, enter the nerves for this virus, and then it will follow into the CNS. If you go from the blood, it will still end up in the CNS. And once you've hit the regional lymph nodes, et cetera, you're at the first stage of the illness. Not feeling that bad, but not ready to be hospitalized. Here, you're here to be hospitalized. Okay, this is just some basic data. Um, it shows you uh, the number of patients, okay, through the clinical course of the infection. Uh, two thirds of the patients will eventually hit recovery. One third of the patients going through stage one, interval stage two, they may have a longer. Um, Recovery time, which will include also the possibility of mortality, death, residual paresis and atrophy of certain structures like muscles, etc. Long term and sometimes permanent neuropsychiatric sequelae. With that fancy way of saying it is, the brain has been infected in some ways, and so the individual starts to demonstrate psychiatric illness as a result of the brain damage. On this side here, we have the tick-borne encephalitis cases reported from 1974 to 2003. And if you notice, um, Austria has been declining, but every other one of these, and there's an average also, that's what that brown line is, have been increasing, okay? Now, keep in mind one other thing. The principle of an increase does not always mean that there's been an increase in the number of pathogens or ticks, just an increase in the capability of detecting it, okay? In this case, detecting the cases, detecting the ticks that have uh, TBE. Okay, so the next one we're going to go to is Lyme disease. Now, if you're not familiar, Lyme disease really was isolated in Lyme, Connecticut. That's where it's first occurring. And it's also known as Lyme Borreliosis. Um, this is a vector-borne disease. It's ca um, caused by Borrelia um, bacteria, uh, Borrelia borgendorferi. And they're spread by ticks of the genus Exoides. Now, in North America, we have two particular species, one more commonly known and the other one just there, and it does cause the same thing, and that is Borrelia mayoni. Okay. The risk of infectious transmission increases with the duration of the tick attachment. That's what I mentioned earlier, and this is a clear example of it. It requires between 36 and 48 hours of attachment by the tick 
for the bacteria that causes the Lyme to travel from within the tick into its saliva and thereby into the person. So what's the most common sign of the infection everybody is familiar with? Erythrea migrans. That's that expanding red rash they sometimes call a bullseye. But it, it'll appear at the site of the tick bite about a week afterwards. Heads up, one thing you need to be really aware of. Only two out of three persons infected ever show up with the erythrea migrants. Now, the rash is neither itchy nor painful. As I said, approximately 70-80% of the infected people develop the rash. The early diagnosis can be difficult. Other early symptoms may include fever, headaches, tiredness. If untreated, then you move into something that's a little bit more uh, having impacting on the patient's life. The symptoms are going to include loss of the ability to move one or both sides of the face, joint pain, severe headaches, neck stiffness, or heart palpitations. Sometimes individuals have had Lyme disease and months and years later, especially if there's also the possibility of repeated exposures, they're going to have joint pain, swelling. Occasionally, they'll start having shooting pains or t tingling in the arms and legs that may develop. And despite appropriate treatment, 10 to 20% of those affected develop joint pains, memory problems, and tiredness for at least six months. There's something you need to be aware of also. If an individual is exposed and they don't detect it and they don't get treated, there may be severe problems with the heart. I knew one young man who was very, very healthy and picked up Lyme disease. He was running one day. He was all playing, uh, preparing to go into... I believe it was the Marines. And what happened was he collapsed. Turns out that the SA node in his heart had failed, in part because of all the bacteria. So he went on a lot of not just oral, but intravenous treatment. And he eventually got the letters from the doctors that said, yep, he's clean. Everything's good. You can make, you know, you can take him in as a Marine. Unfortunately, just before he was to join, he collapsed again and started demonstrating the problems. By the way, he was so sick at one point, they had him down at Boston General. And three times they gave him his last rites. That's how serious this can be. Um, he eventually never made it into the Marines. Now, if you have an early localized infection, you can get the oral administration of doxycycline, which is really the recommended first choice. You got to keep in mind, it's very effective against not only Borrelia uh, bacteria, but also a variety of other illnesses carried by ticks. Doxy, unfortunately, uh, for patients, they have to avoid the sun exposure because of the higher risk of sunburn. Doxycycline is contraindicated in children younger than eight years of age and women who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Now, the antibiotic alternatives there are amoxicillin, cefalofurin, uh, axetil, and azithromycin. Now, azithromycin is recommended only in the case of intolerance to other antibiotics. And here is what you see for Lyme disease. Here's the erythema migrans. That Bullseye. You notice that there's clear. This is the site where the bite occurred. This is red, clear area, and then another ring. Okay. Here you have the larva stages, including the engorged adult female. 
Here you have the year where you start off basically with the eggs hatching around uh, April, May. The larvae are going to feed on small mammals. Small mammals may be the spirochete carrier. And so what happens is the larvae molt into nymphs and they winter over on the mice. Then the nymphs, um, and, and this is a case where you could have up to 250 to 300 nymphs on the mouse. The nymphs are going to become active and they're going to feed on larger hosts. What a lot of times happens is the nymphs will uh, start climbing up on stalks of grass and um, flowers and other things like that. Um, and they get to the top and their top, uh, their, their frontal um, legs are going to be held out to grab onto something such as deer, human, etc. The human infection, the highest risk is getting bitten at that stage and during this period of time, June, July. Okay. The nymphs will eventually molt into adults, and that usually is October. They will feed and mate. Usually this is in a deer, and they will dormant over winter on these deer. The female will lay eggs and die. Now, a couple of other minor things. Um, if a deer has the ticks, when they lay down, or when they drop down, the contaminated zone for those ticks will be up to three meters all around where they were. Okay. Now, this is the reported case of Lyme disease as of 2017 by CDC. Um, if you notice a lot of the dots Yes, there's some diffuse in various areas of the country, in the south, uh, southwest, etc., particularly in the areas where there's a higher population density. Also in the Midwest, look at this, where the New England states and the beginning of the Mid-Atlantic states are. Right around here is ground zero, Lyme, Connecticut. And actually, if you go down there, it's a very pretty community but they will actually have fences and they will have signs saying, do not go into this area. It is infested with ticks. Next, we're going to move into Chagas disease. Now, Chagas disease is caused by a, um, a parasite called uh, Trypanosoma crutzi. Okay. This has also been referred to as American trypanosomiasis. Now there is a tropical, uh, the tropical parasitic infection is transmitted by crawling, blood-sucking insects refer, uh, called either tritomanine bug or the kissing bug. Now, tropical is almost um, very vague because really they have reported that this particular bug is present in many of the states in the south and seems to be moving up a little. Anybody that's exposed to the feces or urine of an infected kissing bug can develop the Chagas disease. Basically what happens is in the evening, the bug will bite, let's say around near the eyes or something. And as it takes in blood, there is a hydrodynamic occurrence where fluid that's taken in, they have to give rid of fluid outside. And so on the back end of it, you'll see this expanding blood colored droplet. That blood colored droplet is loaded with uh, T. crutzi. Okay. Then how does it get inside someone? Because the next day they start scratching around that area. Okay. Chagas disease can cause both a sudden, that is acute, and long-term chronic symptoms. 
and people can be infected infected for a long time without showing any symptoms. Must be clarified there. Uh, acute symptoms. This is in the uh, acute phase. You're going to see um, some swelling at the site of a bug bite, uh, contact with bug feces, flu-like symptoms, fever, body aches, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, abdominal pain, enlarged spleen or liver, swollen glands. Usually this phase will last a few days to a few weeks. Chronic, though, is long-term. The symptoms may start years or even decades after the initial infection, and they include chest pain, heart palpitations, shortness of breath, difficulty eating, difficulty passing a stool, dizziness, uh, fainting, fatigue, and sudden death. Basically without treatment, serious complications, including the heart and the intestinal tract uh, are possible. It is believed that Charles Darwin, in his latter years, had the chronic situation. He may have been in his world travels earlier, bitten, and the symptoms went into sort of like, kind of died down, he didn't pay attention to it. But in his waning years, he was only able to work for about four hours a day and was tired after that and had to rest. Now, fortunately, there are two drugs that are used to treat the infection with trypanosoma crutzi. These are nitrofurtamox and benzodiazole. Now, the vector. These are members of triatomini. It's a subfamily of reduve and these are also going by the name of cone nose bugs, kissing bug, vampire bug. If you see a penny here, this is the comparison of it. And the bugs will hatch from small oval shaped eggs. And they'll go through five nymphal stages before becoming adults. Here's the two adults here. Um, the Males will have a rounded bottom, and the females will have a pointed ovipostor, which is used for basically egg laying. If you notice here, all shaded states have at least one historical record of kissing bugs. Here is a situation for the life cycle of Chagas disease. Now, Chagas disease is a type of protozoal parasite. So, basically what's going to happen is the epimastigoids will divide in the midgut here. They, uh, the bug itself will take a blood meal and the metacyclic uh, tropomastigoids pass in the feces and they may enter the bite wound or mucosal membranes. See, here's the bite. What happens is you'll get a droplet or a blob here. Individuals will find sometimes to scratch that area. Here are uh, the Chagas parasites here moving through the blood. They will enter host cells and transform into intracellular mastigoids, which divide by binary fission. Then the cell bursts, and more of them are released. They transform into uh, trifomastigoids, and these will circulate in the blood and infect other cells. Um, the tritomy bug will take a blood meal, and it will ingest those trifomastigoids. You notice down here, this is the heart. And what is happening is chronic Chagas uh, uh, cardiomyopathy. This is the left side of the heart. This is the left ventricle. You can tell by the thickness of the heart wall. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have an apical aneurysm. You're going to have the damage to the lower part of the heart, which could lead to perhaps even a breach here. Okay. 
And this is more of a very detailed uh, representation of this. Now there is not only Trypanosoma cruzi, but Trypanosoma rengeli. Um, and they're both being transmitted by the triatomini um, as the carrier, as the vector. What you have basically is the bloodstream, they fed, they bought in some of the uh, tripomastigoids. They transform into epimastigoids in the insect midgut here. These will multiply. Then they will migrate to the rectum, where they will differentiate into infective and non -replica, replicate uh, metacycle tropomastigoids. Okay. What's going on is that they migrate through the system until they get down to here. Now, one of the other things, though, is that. Um, the T. wrangley epimastigoids will reach the hemolymph, basically the insect's lymph system of the blood system. They'll multiply there and then invade the salivary glands, and they will differentiate into metacycle uh, trichomastigoids. So in essence, they are injected with the saliva during the feeding process, and that's why they have it down here. But most of the time, what you're going to get is it coming out the back end. And as you can see here, uh, in A, this is the uh, tripomastigoids of trypanosome crutzi in a peripheral blood smear. Here, here, and here. Okay. What you have also is intracellular amastigoids of the Trypanosoma crutzi in a culture of myoblasts. In other words, this is a culture of uh, cardiac muscle cells. And what do you see? Parasite going inside and cultivating inside of these cells. And you can see how the heart is going to be weakened as a result, because when these are when these break free, Obviously, those uh, the uh, myoblasts will die. Also, you're going to see some gastrointestinal manifestations of Chagas disease. In uh, you have a 48-year-old woman as a case came to the United States 10 years previously. She complained of a difficulty swallowing and constipation, so they gave her a barium swallow and it revealed mega esophagus. So she had this enlarged esophagus right here. And in this part B, you have a flat plate of the abdomen revealed a mega colon. So at the other end, the colon is extremely expanded out and it retained the barium. The patient had undergone a barium enema seven months previously. So all of that was still being retained there. Okay. Finally, we have an autopsy uh, specimen of the heart. And you'll notice that it's dilated, hypertrophied, and it has an apical aneurysm. There's the apical aneurysm there. The heart is enlarged. The right side is here. And you really have a lot of problems in the sense of it should be uh, with some structures here, not like what you see here. It's, you'll notice the interceptum, uh, the interventricular septum here is much more enlarged. And so there's a hypertrophy there. There's a hypertrophy here on the left um, ventricular wall. So the total amount of blood moving through is going to be greatly reduced. Now, we have here on this side, pathological findings of an enlarged heart with a radiograph of the patient with Chagas disease. Here is the heart. It's much larger. As you notice here, you're getting down to the lower parts of the vertebrae. 
the diaphragm should be right around here and it's not, it's being pushed down. Okay, so we're gonna move into next, Zika virus and also congenital Zika viral infection. Now, you have to understand Zika viruses are part of, it's, it's a type of arthropod-borne virus and they use the term arbovirus, a sort of shortened version. And it's transmitted primarily by Aedes mosquitoes. Now, Aedes mosquitoes include not only just Aedes alibopictus, it's Aedes aegypti. And the thing is, these are much more aggressive and nasty. They bite during the day, etc. Now, Zika has been found to be spread through sexual contact from a pregnant woman to their baby and through blood transfusion. And uh, though this has not been reported in the United States, the Zika virus replicates in the mosquitoes mid-gut epithelial cells and then migrates to its salivary gland cells. After five to 10 days, the virus can be found in the, the mosquito's saliva. Okay, so aside of the bite, sexual contact, a person who is pregnant can pass it to the baby, also by transfusion of blood, okay? Now, many people infected with Zika virus won't have symptoms or will only have mild symptoms. The most common symptoms of Zika are fever, rash, headache, joint pain, which is also referred to as arthalgia, conjunctivitis, okay, and muscle pain. Now, infection in adults has been linked to Guillain-Barre syndrome, and the Zika virus has been shown to infect human Schwann cells. Now, you keep in mind, Schwann cells, those are the cells that basically maintain myelination of the peripheral nervous system. Now, those who do typically have symptoms include rash, fever, conjunctivitis, muscle joint pain, malaise, headache, and this may last two to seven days. If a person is infected with Zika while pregnant, sadly, the child will be born with brain defects and a smaller head size. This is referred to as microcephaly. There is no specific medicine for Zika. There is no vaccine or specific treatment. Instead, the focus is on relieving the symptoms and includes rest, rehydration, and acetaminophen for the fever and pain. Aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like NSAIDs like ibuprofen should be avoided. Now let's talk about it more from um, the congenital Zika viral infection, which is referred to as CZS. If you have a Zika virus infection during pregnancy, this is gonna cause microcephaly. Uh, it may also contribute to other congenital malformations in the infant, including limb contractures, high muscle tone, abnormalities, and hearing loss. These clinical features are collectively referred to as congenital Zika syndrome, CZS. If a person is infected and the child is born with uh, brain defects, um, and a smaller size, what happens? Uh, it's not very nice. That child is going to basically be having a smaller intellect, um, etc., through the rest of its life. Now, for the purpose of evaluating an infant for possible congenital Zika virus infection, microencephaly is defined as occipital frontal circumference less than the third percentile based on standard growth charts for sex, age, and gestational age of birth. For diagnosis of microencephaly to be made, 
Okay. This should be disproportionately small and not explained by other etiologies. In other words, the microencephaly cannot be caused by other congenital disorders, viruses, or other types of diseases. A lot of times the children affected by CZS may develop uh, severe symptoms, and, and this is including moderate to severe global neurodevelopmental delay, epilepsy, blindness, hearing loss, and hypotonia. The symptoms that are unique to congenital Zika syndrome, severe microencephaly in which the skull has partially collapsed, decreased brain tissue with a specific pattern of brain damage, including subcortical calcifications, damage to the back of the eye, including macular scarring and focal retinal uh, pigmentary modeling, congenital contractures such as club fo foot or arthrogryposis, and finally hypertonia restricting the body movements soon after birth. Now, with Zika, the general symptoms are listed here. Muscle pain, rash, headache, red eyes, fever, joint pain. You can see this listed here. There's no real uh, vaccine and there's no real antivirals to treat it. So usually the patients are encouraged to get lots of rest, drink lots of water, and take certain uh, pain fever uh, medication. Here, sadly, is an individual. Notice that what you see here, the normal head size in those dotted lines, and the severe microcephaly with the partially collapsed skull. You have macular scarring with uh, the focal pigmentary retinal modeling. Uh, intracranial calcifications, these are going to be located between the cortex and the subcortex. You're going to have cortical hypoplasia with abnormal gyral patterns. You have arthrogryposis here and here. Okay. Now, um, what are the countries and territories with a history of Zika virus transmission? As you can see throughout the archipelago here, um, going into Indonesia and eventually getting into India, you have areas in the black that are Africa, as well as France. South America is quite a significant distribution. Central America, uh, the Caribbean islands area, and unfortunately the United States. I will say from my own personal experience, when I was at a conference, and they had just announced about Zika and the president um, was going to be dealing with this. This was uh, President um, Obama. The American Society of Microbiology had this um, emergency meeting. And we're talking about eight, no, excuse me, 7.15 in the morning. They had um, basically... Um, one of the heads there and said, I've been speaking with the White House. I've got to go back to the White House, etc." There was a lot of concern in microbiologists and doctors, etc., about Zika. And there were situations where individuals who had had research on this and unfortunately they they should have been at the forefront and instead were at the rear okay and that's just the way sometimes science goes all right so we're pretty much covered all of this this is for week four you were to review lecture the lecture powerpoints you were to read all the supplemental ar articles i've included in the module week eight review all of the videos in module week eight Read the chapters for week eight. Participate and complete the discussion for week eight.
Now you got to keep in mind, some discussion assignments require you to review the videos, the supplemental articles, etc. And then finally, you will complete the quiz for week eight. Have a nice day.